the Prophet وسلم, his mother passed away in Abwa. But where was the Prophet at that time? In Medina. So the Messenger Sallallahu Wasallam, he was in Medina at that time when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's mother passed away. The Prophet was in Medina. Who brought the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from Medina to his granddad? وَأَقُولُ قَالَ اللَّهُ جَلَّ جَلَالُهُ وَالْمُصْطَفَ الْهَادِي وَلَا أَتَأَوَّلُ الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We're going to resume the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah ta'ala, today we're going to go in great details regarding kafalatu jaddihi abdil muttarib. The, the Prophet's mother passed away. We spoke about that in details. Some of you might think the seerah were bringing back the same points. Now what I do at the beginning is I go over it very lightly and then I come back to the same points again and I go into great details regarding it. So today, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to go in great details regarding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mother passed away now and he's been taken care of. Does anyone know who took care of him after his mother passed away? Hey, Habibi. Yeah? He's, what's his name? Abdul Muttalib. Jazakallahu khayran. The Prophet, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's mother has now passed away and his granddad has taken, oh, taken care of him. Uh, it mentions that the Prophet وسلم, when his mother passed away, where was she? Where was his mother when he, when he passed away? Huh? His mother passed away in Abu'a. But where was the Prophet at that time? In Medina. So the Messenger وسلم, he was in Medina at that time when the Prophet وسلم's mother passed away. The Prophet was in Medina. Who brought the Prophet وسلم, from Medina to his granddad? Yeah? What was her name? Yeah? yeah? Not Suwaiba. Ummu Ayman. Ummu Ayman. She brought the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam She brought him to Mecca And the first person she came to was Abdul Muttalib And she placed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And she he was shrouded And she gave him to his granddad And she put him in his palms And she said to him that his mother has passed away He had already lost who? He had already lost his father Now he lost his mother and his granddad is taking care of him. They say that Abdul Muttalib, when the messenger was brought to him and was placed in his hands, his heart, it melted. He felt this feeling of يعني, extreme care for the Prophet And they said he cried, and he always used to keep the Prophet right next to him. He would say, stay next to me. He would say, you can't, you can't go anywhere else. If Abdul Muttalib would go to somewhere where he didn't want anybody else to be with him, yeah, and he seclude himself from the community of people at times, he would let the Prophet come with him. And he would say, stay with me. He would never eat food unless the Prophet ate with him. They wouldn't trust anyone to feed him. They would say, me and him have to eat together. The love of Abdul Muttalib was so much towards the Prophet Al-Imam Al-Hakim, Abu Abdullah Al-Hakim Al-Naysaburi, he has a kitab called Al-Mustadraka. And in that kitab, Al-Imam Al-Hakim mentions Bisarad al-Sahih, an authentic chain, that uh, Kindir Ibn Sa'id narrated from his father He said Hajajtu fil jahiliyyah This is the love that Abdul Muttalib had for the Prophet Hajajtu fil jahiliyyah Kindir Ibn Sa'id mentions this from his father 
that he did Hajj before Islam. Okay. فَإِذَا أَنَا بِرَجْلٌ يَطُوفُ بِالْبَيْتِ He saw a man circumambulating around the Kaaba, going around the Kaaba, يعني doing tawaf around the Kaaba. وَهُوَ يَرْتَجِزُ This man was shaking. وَيَقُولُ أَنِي وَسَيْهِ رَبِّ رُدَّ عَلَيَّ رَاكِبِ مُحَمَّدًا رُدَّهُ إِلَيَّ وَاسْطَنِعْ عِنْدِي يَدًا Wallah returned back Muhammad to me. This man was shaking and he was asking for Muhammad to be brought to his, and he, to his palms again and he could look after him and have a very close relationship with him. So he said, I asked, who's that man crying and saying all of that? Well, who is he talking about? They said, this is Abdul Muttalib, Ibn Hashim. This was the time that Amina bint Wahbin, when she went to Medina and she had left. He was crying at that time when the Prophet was taken uh, from him. So this is the love that Abdul Muttalib had for the Prophet They said that his love was so unique that it was even more than all of his kids. All of the children that he had, the Prophet was unique. Abdul Muttalib, as you know, was the leader of Quraysh. He was put in a high position. Abdul Muttalib, two things he had. He had the qualities of leadership and something a person should read into and look into. He had the quality of a leader. And on top of that, they said he had an appearance. Yani when you saw him, he was an individual, rahimahullah, and, uh, not rahimahullah, he was a Muslim. Abdul Muttalib had a uh, quality that when you saw him, he was, you would respect him. As soon as you see him, he had Hayba. You would respect him. We mentioned the story of Abaraha. When he first saw Abdul Muttalib, he could, you would just respect him straight away. The way he looked, the way he talked, the way he spoke, the way he sat, the way he stood, the way he was, his movements and everything. To the extent he said, sit here, just sit next to me. But he sat in Abaraha, who wanted to conquer the Kaaba, destroy it was saying to Abdul Muttalib, sit next to me. That was the sort of person he was. So they said that this Hayba, this respect that he had, and this يعني, leadership that he had, it even was in his children. His children respected him as a leader, more than their father. And they said if he sat on a Firash, if he sat on somewhere, no one else would be allowed to sit on that same Firash as Abdul Muttalib. He wouldn't, they wouldn't, no one would sit with him. Not that he would say not to sit with me, but it's just not everybody respected him that much. They had that respect for him. They wouldn't do that. If he sat under the shade and he took the shade, no one would even want to be under the same shade as him out of respect for him. The only person who would is Rabbi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was narrated and it was mentioned وَكَانَ يُوضَعُ لِعَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ فِرَاشٌ فِي ظِلِّ الْكَعْبَةِ A firash. It was like a carpet for us today. It wasn't made from what is made for us today. He would sit on it. فَكَانَ بَنُوهُ يَجْلِسُونَ حَوْلَ فِرَاشِهِ And his children, they would sit around that firash. They would sit around it. Not on it. Around it. Until he leaves, حَتَّى يَخْرُجَ إِلَيْهِ Until he leaves it, they will all then sit on it if they wanted to. وَكَانَ لَا يَجْسُ عَلَيْهِ أَحَدٌ مِنْ بَنِيهِ إِجْلَالًا لِعَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ And they would do this merely to respect him. The respect that they had for him. فَكَانَ الرَّسُولُ يَأْتِي وَهُوَ غُلَامٌ جَفْرٌ But the messenger Muhammad ibn Abdullah صلى الله عليه وسلم would come and he would sit on it. And the people would stop him. فَيَأْخُذُ أَعْمَامُهُ His uncles, the Prophet's uncles, the children of who? Abdul Muttalib. They would try to stop the Prophet on sitting on the firash, on the carpet. لِيُؤَخِرُهُ uh, عَنْهُ They would say, sit, sit backwards. فَيَقُولُ Abdul Muttalib would say, دَعُوا ابن يجلس. Leave my son alone, let him sit. فَوَاللَّهِ إِنَّ لَهُ لَشَأْنَا Wallahi, this boy, he's got big affairs. I see something in him, that spark. This boy, if he lives, he's going to come out with something. 
ثم يجلسه معه على الفراش and he would say sit with me on the فراش ويمسح ظهره بيده and he would wipe his hand on the prophet's chest ويسره ما يراه يصنع and every movement and gesture that the messenger would do Abdul Muttalib would be amazed by it and he would love it he loved everything about the prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام but as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has destined everything Allah has destined for the time of Abdul Muttalib to come to an end and brothers everything Allah does subhanahu wa ta'ala there is a wisdom behind it sometimes we know the wisdom and sometimes we don't know what the wisdom is Abdul Muttalib when the messenger reached the age of eight eight years old the grandfather Abdul Muttalib he passed away and the scholars that mentioned that it was eight years of age it was a prophet the prophet was eight when Abdul Muttalib passed away is number one Ibn Kathir Ibn Kathir rahimahullah he's of the opinion and he strengthens the opinion that the prophet was eight eight, eight years of age he says ثُمَّ كَانَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ فِي كَفَالَةِ جَدِّي عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ إِلَىٰ أَنْ تُوفِيَ وَلَهُ مِنَ الْعُمْرِ ثَمَانِ سِنِينَ He was eight years of age. The second scholar who also held the opinion that the Prophet was eight, eight, eight years of age is Ibn Al-Qayyim Al-Jawziya رحمه الله. He says, وَكَفِلَهُ جَدُّهُ عَبْدُ الْمُطَّلِبِ وَتُوفِيَ وَلِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ نَحُوْ ثَمَانِ سِنِينَ The Prophet was, was eight years of age. Also, Ibn Abi Al-Izz Al-Hanafi in his Urjuzatul Mi'iyya fi dhikri hali ashraf al bariya he also holds the opinion that the Prophet was eight years of age. Now, Abdul Muttalib said, he realized that he was dying, so he passed over the uh, care of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he passed it over to his uncle. The Prophet's uncle, his own son. He said to him, you look after him. And he specifically picked and chose Abu Talib. And the hikmah and the reason why he did that was because لِأَنَّ عَبْدَ اللَّهِ Because Abdullah, the father of the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam وَأَبَا طَالِبْ And also Abu Talib أَخَوَانِ لِأَبٍ وَأُمِّنْ They had the same father and they also had the same mother. So they were more closer. Abu Talib and who? And Abdullah. They were closer. Who knows what the name of their mother was? The mother of the Prophet's father's mother. And the mother of Abu Talib. Who knows? Who, what was her name? Does anyone know? Her name was Fatima Binti Amr Ibn Aidin. That was her name. She was the mother Fatima Binti Amr Ibn Aidin. She was the mother of Abdullahi, the Prophet's father, and Abu Talib. Abu Talib, as soon as Abdul Muttalib placed the Prophet in his hands, he stood up in the best way a person can take care of an orphan child or a young kid. He took him in with open hands. Rather, he went beyond and above for the Prophet ﷺ. This story I'm going to mention here, the strongest opinion that it's not authentic. Ibn Sa'ad mentions it. Uh, in his tabaqat, it's not an authentic chain for it. But Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anuma, it's not authentic. But again, min bab al fa'ida wal isti'nas, we can inshallah ta'ala just take it and benefit from it. When the messenger passed away, Abdul Muttalib qabada Abu Talib. Abdul Muttalib, who's the father of Abu Talib, he grabbed him. Um, Close. Yani, Abdul Muttalib grabbed Abu Talib very close to him, squeezed him. 
And he said to him, I know you have no wealth. I, don't, I know you don't have anything. But if you have to feed a person from all of your children and yourself, put Muhammad first. Put what? Muhammad first. Two things we benefit from this is number one, Abu Talib took that word serious from his father, which is even jahiliya qabl al-Islam, you tend to realize the concept of birrul walidain was generally there. The concept of what? Obedient towards your parents, it was really there. Imagine telling someone, all of your children ignore them, if, uh, and this child, is the one you need to have an eye on. And he takes, Daddy, I'll do this. The importance of what? Children being obedient towards their parents is very important. Nowadays, it's not the case, is it? When it comes to obedient towards the what? The parents. When the parents reach an age, <coughs> they don't know what they're talking about, etc. So Abu Talib, what he did was he took the Prophet in alayhi salatu was salam, and he took care of him, he fed him. That they said Abu Talib would make sure the Prophet was full in, before he let his children eat. He would never let him sleep on any other place except right next to him. If Abu Talib ever traveled, the Prophet traveled with him. They ate together, they slept together, they traveled together. I'm going to mention a story of one of their journeys and their travels. Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi narrated in his Jabir that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Talib went out to Sham. They went to Sham. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Talib were not alone. They were not alone. Yani there was with them Ashiyahu Quraysh. The figureheads of Quraysh were with him. Okay? They were with, with him. The narration mentions فَلَمَّا أَشْرَفُوا عَلَى الرَّاهِبِ A monk, a worshipper, a rahib is a monk. You would see this term, a rahib, in the books of hadith. You would see them in Kutub al-Sirr. The rahib, the monks are very unique individuals. If you look at how they were. They were monks in the sense where they cut from the dunya. They had no relationship with the dunya. The dunya was the last thing for them. And they used to live in what is called in Arabic a sawma'ah. That's where they lived. A monastery, huh? But the thing is, the Christian ones, they stayed in single places. And this is how their buildings were. It wasn't a building, but the place they stayed, this is how it was. There was two floors. The bottom floor, he didn't stay. He stayed on the second floor. But he, he would be the only person to be able to go to the second floor because the way to go to the second floor is with a rope. Sometimes it was with staircase that would come down. And whenever he went up, he would pull it up. No one could come to him. No one could talk to him. He was cut off from the dunya. He would stay there and he would worship and he would contemplate and he would cut away from everybody if he ever needed anything he would come buy his stuff and he would go back to his place and some of these monks they were worshippers for 70 plus years 40 years 50 years 60 years and they would never get married nothing all they took from the dunya was eating etc and drinking and that's it when Islam came Islam warned against this the Prophet Sallallahu he said, this practice has nothing to do with Islam. You're not allowed to do that. Rather, the Prophet Sallallahu he praised the person who interacts with the people and endures their hardship. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu he praised the one that he mixes with the person, the people. He buys, he sells, he interacts with the people, doesn't cut off from the people. And he endures 
the hardship that he faces from the people. The people are not all good, are they? So whatever he goes through, he's patient. These are the best of people, the Prophet told So in Islam, it's not a praiseworthy thing to do, yani, to do that practice. So this monk saw from far the word Ashrafu, it means hubut. It's when you come down from somewhere very high and you come down. So this monk was watching them. And he saw the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Talib and the heads of Quraysh. They tied their camel somewhere and the monkey came walking to them. When they tied their camels and their riding beasts, he came walking to them and he said to them, and before that he just kept looking at them, observing them. He wouldn't come out to them. Whilst they were tying their camels, some of the narrations mentioned, when they finished tying their camels, he came up to them. And then he said to them, who is the leader of these people that came right now? Who's their head? Who's in charge of this group of people? Some of the narration mentions the monk went and started to look at the Prophet's hands. He started looking and observing the Prophet And then he asked, who's the leader of these people? Another narration mentions he looked at the Prophet's hands and he preserved him from all directions, walked around him, looked at him, and kept looking at him. And then he said, Hada Sayyidul Alameen. This man will be the master of the Alam. Another narration adds on him saying, He said, Hada Rasulullah. This, this is the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will send him as a mercy to all mankind. Some of the people who were there, they said to him, Ma ilmuka. How do you know all of this? You're saying. This is a monk, as I just mentioned to you, who doesn't talk to the people. He doesn't mix with the people. If he comes into the market, he buys and he eats and he runs away. They don't mix with people. They believe if they talk to the people, they, it's going to take their hearts. So they run away from all of this. Huh? For him to say this, caught Kufar Quraysh by surprise. He said, how do you know all of this? Where did you get all of this knowledge from? He mentioned a few things. He said, When you guys came from that high land, um, no tree, and no rocks or pebbles or stones. None of them, illa khara sajid, and all of them were prostrating. When you guys walked by, all of the trees, all of the rocks and the pebbles, they all prostrated. And the truth of the matter is, wala yasjudani illa li nabi. They don't prostrate except to a prophet. That's number one. That's what I saw. Number two, wa inni a'rifuhu bi khatamin nubuwa. The second reason is I know the seed of prophecy, and he's got it. This young boy. Then the monk went and he made food for them. He tried to feed them. And then he looked at Abu Talib and he said to him, this is what I saw, this is what I encountered. I believe this boy has something special to offer. Please don't bring him out again. Because he was a Christian. He said, if the Jews, they see this young boy, they may harm him. Why? Because the Jews were expecting the Prophet to come from who? The Prophet to come from who? They, were th they wanted it to come from them. It was always used to come from them. Duh. Hey, let's, uh, let's take a challenge. After Nabi Ismail, 
Who was the Arab prophet that came? After Ismail. We know Ibrahim gave birth to two sons, right? Some scholars, they mention more than that. But two are the prophets. Ismail and Ishaq. Ishaq gave birth to who? Yaqub was called what? Israel is Yaqub's name. That's why they are called Bani Israel, meaning the children of Yaqub. Sah? Allah says, كل الطعام كان حلا لبني إسرائيل إلا ما حرم إسرائيل على نفسه من قبل أن تنزل التوراة قل فأتوا بالتوراة فتلوها إن كنتم صادقين إذن إسماعيل إسرائيل is called يعقوب إذن from يعقوب how many prophets came? many prophets from sorry إسحاق and then يعقوب and from there came many prophets so Bani Israel had many prophets from there. Musa, Isa, all of them came from there. Are we all together? Even uh, Nabi Lahi, Sulaiman, and Dawood, and all of them, they came from that. Ismail gave birth to the children of what? The Arab. Hey, how many prophets came from Ismail? Hey, only Nabi Lahi Muhammad. Some of you might say, what about Hud and Salih? They were before Ismail. They were prophets, Arabs, but they were before Ismail. So after Ismail, they were used to this idea that the prophets were coming from them. It was all coming from Ya'qub, 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 Ya'qub. All the prophets were coming from Ya'qub. Are we all together? But in that case, the very Israel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the Quran, how much he honored them. Yeah? I gave you everything. I preserved, I honored you, I showered everything onto you. I, all prophets were from you. Are we all together? But this time what happened was the prophet came from Ismail. So this monk, he said, if they find out this, that the last and final prophet is not from them, something will happen to this same prophet. So take care of him. Don't bring him again. Protect him from it. Some of the scholars, they disputed on the authenticity of the story, whether it's Sahih or not. It's from the scholars who authenticated the story, because it's a very, it says a lot, right? What does it say? There's a lot of things in there. From the things that are in there, is that prostration was done for who other than Allah. Are we all together? And in the previous religions, the prostrations were what? The prostration for other than Allah was not considered shirk in the previous nations. Are we all together, brothers? This is a vital information that you need to know. The tahiyya, sorry, the uh, sujood was two types. Sujood tahiyya, which was a form of greeting. Are we all together, brothers? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he command the angels to do for Adam alayhi salam when he was created? To prostrate for him. Are we all together? So then they used to prostrate. After that, like in what happened? Islam banned anyone prostrating for anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are we all together? So that's why these trees, when they prostrated, what did the monk interpret it as? He said, وَلَا يَسْجُدَانِ إِلَّا إِلَّا لِنَبِي They don't prostrate except for a what? A prophet. So the previous religions, they had their rules. That cannot be used as a ruling, as a permissibility of prostrating for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of the scholars, they authenticated the story. I'm, my heart is content with the authentication of this story. From the scholars who authenticated it is number one, Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi. He graded this story to be Hassan. Number one. From them is the great scholar Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. In his kitab Al-Isabah fi Tamyiz al-Sahaba, he authenticates it. And he grades it to be Sahih. 
Al-Imam Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, Hafid Ibn Kathir, he also authenticates it and grades it to be Sahih. Al-Imam Abu Abdullah Al-Hakim Al-Naysaburi, he also grades it to be Sahih. And finally, Muhammad Nasir al-Din al-Albani, he also grades it to be Sahih. He grades it to be Sahih. One of the great scholars who really refused to accept the authentication of this hadith, argued against it, spoke against it, is Al-Imam al-Dhahabi rahimahullah. Al-Imam al-Dhahabi, he grades this hadith to be munkar, rejected and not authentic. Okay? And he takes two reasons why he believes. He questions the, the chain and then he also questions the content of the story. Um, Now we want to go into Abu Talib. What he did was he placed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a shepherd. As I mentioned to you, Abu Talib did not have much wealth. When the messenger returned from Sham and the messenger came back to Mecca, Abu Talib tried his hardest to increase in his wealth, to make some form of risk for himself. So he was working very hard in his goats and taking care of it. He did not want to be in a situation where he had nothing. And so I mentioned to you before Abu Talib, whatever he did, the Prophet did it with him. And this then forced the Prophet ﷺ to be a what? To be one who helped Abu Talib in taking care of the sheep. So he became a shepherd, the Prophet ﷺ. And this didn't just stick to the Prophet looking after Abu Talib's flock of sheep, but it moved on to the Prophet starting to do it for other people and taking a salary from them. The Prophet would take a a salary, a wages, and he would look after other people's uh, shepherds. Um, the Prophet said in a hadith, in his sahih, in hadith Abi Hurairah, and I want brothers to really take this, wallahi there's so much knowledge in the Prophet Two sciences, when people, when you look at it, there's a lot of knowledge in it. The tafsir of the Quran and the seerah of the Prophet You learn so much in them. The Prophet said, مَا بَعَثَ اللَّهُ نَبِيًّا That there was not a Prophet Allah sent out إِلَّا رَعَ الْغَنَمْ Except that he was a shepherd. All the Prophets were shepherds then. Okay. So the Sahaba, they said, وَأَنْتَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Even you. And the Prophet said, نَعَمْ كُنْتُ أَرْعَاهَا Of course, I was a shepherd. I used to take care of flocks of sheep I used to take from it I used to look after it Qararit means for some dinar and some dirhams I used to charge I used to work In Adab al-Mufrad Bukhari The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said بُعِثَ مُوسَى Nabi Allah Musa was sent out وَهُوَ رَاعِ غَنَمْ He was a shepherd وَبُعِثَ دَاوُود وَهُوَ رَاعِ غَنَمْ Nabi Allah Dawood, the king He was a shepherd وَبُعِثْتُ أَنَا and even me وَأَنَا أَرْعَى غَنَمًا لِأَهْلِ لِأَهْلِ بِأَجْيَادًا Now some of you might ask what was the wisdom of all the prophets being shepherds? Honestly, I think you need to write this as a very beneficial things in it by being a shepherd. Number one, the first benefit that is in being a shepherd is that when you are a shepherd, it trains you 
أنه يحصل له التمرن it will train you برعيها على ما يكفلونه من القيام بأمر أمتهم it will train you in how you need to take care of the ummah funny enough the human beings have a lot of similarities with these flock of sheep the sheep is not like the camel the prophet didn't say all oh, the prophets they used to take care of camels there's a few reasons why the people who take care of camels are generally arrogant people are we all together they're rich upper class got camels number one number two the camel you just have to take care of the first one the front one and the rest they follow that one there's a saying in my language there's a saying in my Somali language which is I won't say it in my language I might say it wrong and those people who know the language might hear me say it and they say you said it wrong so I won't put myself in that predicament but they say the oldest child in the house they compare it to the the camel the front one all of the other camels they follow the what that one so the oldest child they always say to him you are you're the big camel all of your other siblings they what they will follow you this is the comparison they do so the camels they're like that the camel the front first one is the one that you you take care of and all the other camels they go in line and they follow that the sheep are not like that the goats are not like that they all go different directions they all divided and the job of the prophet is what to bring all types of people of different colors and nations and tongues and backgrounds and upbringings and all of them and keep them together in one direction we all go in this way so it trains the person number one number two أن في مخالطتها ما يحصل لهم الحلم والشفقة. The second حكمة في رعي الأنبياء عليهم السلام للغنم. The second reason is أن في مخالطتها mixing with the goats and the sheep ما يحصل لهم الحلم والشفقة. It will build in you forbearance. And it will also bring in your heart's care. Because the sheep are very, very soft animals, you, you care a lot for them, more than you care for a camel. Camel's big, it can take care of itself. You don't need to feed it water for a few days. Huh? Maybe a month, 40 days, it can stay without water. Even it can stay without food for days. Like in the, cow, the sheep, you have to take care, the goats and all of that, you have to take care of a lot of it. And then it also teaches you forbearance, endurance of hardship and all of it because they tire you out. Number three. The goats were specifically mentioned for the prophets or they were made shepherds over goats is because the goats are actually weak animals. They were what? They're weak animals. And if a prophet was made to look after camels, he would only be taking care of the upper class and he would abandon the lower class, right? So the prophet is being trained that every single body matters. And that's why that training that the prophet took here, when it happened that the message of an Islam spread, who were the first people to accept Islam? Were they the upper class or were they were they the heads of Quraysh or were they those who were low in the community that were looked down at? Who were they? If he was used to only being around the rich people, if he was used to around being up with the upper class, he would find it hard to be with the lower class later. Are we all together, brothers? He would find it hard and etc. And so that's why the Prophet والسلام, and all the other Prophets, they went through that. Number four. The reason why being shepherd 
is also from the things that the prophets used to do is because it's not an easy job to make money from that. Yani to go out, look for grass. Different, you have fear that somebody might take it from you. You don't know what you're going to meet. There is no plan that you follow. In the sense where things can go different ways. Are we all together? So, it's one of the hardest ways to make a risk. But it's also from one of the what? The best ways to make money. Some of the narrations, the Prophet Sallallahu he mentioned that Afdalul Kasab, one of the way, best ways to make money, some of the narrations, is Ra'yul Ghalam, being a shepherd. There's also other narrations that have suggested other things and other ways. And some of the scholars, they said the reason why it was the best way to make money is because of all the prophets were like this. So it's the best way to make money. The fifth reason or the fifth wisdom behind being a shepherd is Allah wanted to humble the prophets. Later you guys are going to be the best of people. But you have to go through a stage in your life in order to reach that stage, you have to start from the bottom and make your way up. So they will be teaching you, they will be taught, and they will be educated with what? A tawab, humility. And once they get that characteristics of humility, they're gonna have that through the course of their life with their Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine knowing. That you are the best of creation, according to a view. Or at least you are the best of the children of Adam. Are we all together, brothers? Imagine you were told that. I'm not talking about being told that you're from the people of Jannah. No, I'm saying you know that you are the best of the children of Adam. You are the prophet of Allah. Is there any stage you can look for higher than that? Huh? So to be humble at a stage like that, the scholars, they said, that one of the factors that Allah put in place was Ra'yul Ghanam. Okay, from a very young age, which brothers teaches us something. Our children, the professions that they take on board, the work tasks that we give them, the things that they work towards, it should be skills that will help them when they what? When they grow older, is very beneficial for them. Are we all together, brothers? It to be a profession that carves your personality into the best form that you can possibly be. Are we all together, brothers? So these are the benefits or the wisdoms of prophets being shepherds. Now we're going to talk about some of the things that the Prophet ﷺ saw. Our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he participated, or he was present, participated, but he was present when a battle took place called Harbul Fijar. Harbul Al Fijar. Our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he reached the age of 15, 15 years of age, and some of the scholars, they said, no, 20, alayhi salatu wasalam. A battle happened called Harbul Fijar. As a benefit, right, this battle. This battle, the reason why it's called Al-Fijar. Fijar, by the way. Some people pronounce it wrong. It's Fijar ala wazni qital. Okay? Which basically means, or it was named that name because it happened in the sacred months. It happened and it took place في الأشهر الحرم That's what Ibn Kathir mentions in his Kitab Al-Bidayah and Nihaya It happened in the sacred months The months you can't fight It took place This battle was between Quraysh amongst themselves 
and some of the people of Kinana were with them. Between them and also between uh, Qais, another tribe. So we had Kinana and Qais. No, no, we had Qais who fought Quraysh and Kinana. So Qais was on one side and Quraysh and Kinana were also on another side. The battle had phases. The first phase, Qais were beating Quraysh and Kinana in the morning, in the early stage. And then in the middle of the day, Quraysh beat Kina, uh, Qais. Quraysh and Kinana beat Qais. And the Prophet was there when this battle took place. And what happened? So he could see that his uncles, his family members, putting together their weaponry, getting ready, organizing it there themselves. The Messenger والسلام, did not take participation in it. Also, the Prophet وسلم, he participated or he was there when a confederacy took place, which was known as Hilful Fubul. And Imam al Suhaili in his Kitab Rawdul Unuf. He mentions that this confederacy or this hilf, this agreement, this contract, Al Imam Al Suhailiyu he said, Kana hilful fuduli akram hilfin sumi'abihi. It was one of the greatest confederacies that were heard. Especially fi ayyam al Arab, the days of the Arabs. It was unheard of, something unique. Why was it? This hilf, it took place in the month of Dil Qidah, in one of the months of Shahri Haram. This, took, this confederacy took place after the battle of Harbul Fijar. One month, and some scholars they said four months. Listen to this. The reason for this contract or this hilf was a man from the people of Zubaid. Zubaid is a place in Yemen. He came to Mecca. This man came from, he was from the people of Zubaidin from Yemen. And he came with some merchants. He came with some stuff. He wanted to sell these things. So he sold it to a man by the name of Al-As ibn Wa'il. Who knows Al As ibn Wa'il? Yeah, who knows her? Fadal. Amr ibn As is father. Are we all together? Al As ibn Wa'il. Amr ibn As, the father of who? Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Al As ibn Wa'il. Are we all together? So this man came from Zubayd. He had some merchants, he wanted to sell it in Mecca. He knew the Arabs wanted it. They were unique, they came from Yemen. So he sold it to Al As ibn Wa'il. Al As ibn Wa'il took the merchants and he refused to give him his money. And he said, I'm not going to give you no money. So what did this Zubaydi man do? He called on his people. He called on his people. He said, look, this man, I gave him my stuff and now he's, he's refusing to give me my money. Now, this is not their territory. This is not their land. The people of Zubayd, they're from Yemen. This is not their land. This is not their people. How does he get help? Those days, the person who's an outsider would tend to have allegiance with a group of people within the land, right? And that was their form of... So if they came to that place, they would always be taken care of because they have allegiance. So the people of Zubay, they had a hilf, a contract, a form of allegiance with the people of Abdiddar. 
اوكي من مخزوم من جمح من سهم من عدي بن كعب they already had hilf with all of those tribes and the, the, the hilf is basically it's called hilf al it's a contract of allegiance we take care of you when you come to my land and everything we share the money if there was some agreement if our people kill another people unjust you guys will help us pay the money black blood money if you people your people kill somebody unjustly we will help you as well yani that was the kind of allegiance are we all together so now is when the contract needs to be pulled up so the people of zubayd they went to the people they had the hilf with the contract with abd dar makhzum and jumah and saham and adib and kaab all of them they looked at al asim ibn wa'il and they looked at this zubaydi man and they said to him there's sorry there's nothing we can really do for you where was the agreement what was that we had a promise we had an agreement that we would the narration mentions fa abu an yu'inuhu ala al asim ibn wa'il rather they scolded him and they told they told him off so this zubaydi man when he saw the evil he went and he climbed a big mountain called jabal abu qubais jabal jabal abu qubais this young boy has lost his parents help him ah. So this man Al-Wa'il Al ibn As he, sorry this Zubaydi man he climbed a mountain he climbed a mountain and on there he screamed this mountain Jabal Abu Qubais a time when he believed the Quraysh and everybody is there and he screamed on the top of his lungs and then he read lines of poetry يا آل فهر لمظلوم بضاعته ببطن مكة نائي الدار والنفر ومحرم أشعث ومش ومحرم أشعث تو لم يقض عمرته يا للرجال وبين الحجر والحجر إن الحرام لمن تمت كرامته ولا حرام لثوب الفاجر الغدر العربي poetry and eloquence and words like that penetrated their hearts so he said what is this deception in a place in مكة this land, this holy land, in front of you all, I get my rights get taken from me like this. I get deceived. The Arabs, the things that they had in them, their khuluq was they had, they believed a, a guest should be taken care of, even if tribalism was something there. But this is a wife, he's, he's our guest. As Zubayr ibn Abdul Muttalib, the Prophet's uncle, stood up. And he said, He said, What this man said, we can't just abandon it and disregard it. Something has to be done about it. So he called on his people, Banu Hashim. And then he also said, Zuhra, you also come. Taym ibn Murrah, Abu Bakr's people, come. All these people he called. And they all came together in the house of Abdullah ibn Jad'an. They came into his house. They, sorry. they sat down and they signed a contract between themselves. And they said to each other, from this minute, from this day together, all of us sitting here, anyone who's ever oppressed in our presence, we will all stand as one voice to get rid of it. We will, ne we will never let oppression happen. No one should ever be oppressed in front of us. All of us must come together. Until his rights is given to him. Quraysh then called this, this conf 
Federacy, they called it, I mean, this Hilf, they called it Hilf al Fudul. They went to Al Wa'a and then they said, This contract starts now. Let's go to Al Asim al Wa'il, take the rights of him. They went and they took the rights of him and they brought it to uh, the Zubaydi man. They gave him his rights. The Prophet, alayhi salatu was salam, he was there. 15, 20. Alayhi salatu salam, fi raya, a young boy, young man. He was there and he saw everything that took place. The Prophet said when he became a Prophet of Allah, when he became a Nabi, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Laqad Shahidtu, I was there, Fi Dari Abdullah ibn Jad'an, I was in the house of Abdullah ibn Jad'an. Hilfan, I saw a, a contract that took place, Law du'itu bihi fil Islam la ajabtu. If anybody was to call me to sort for that same contract, I would sign it. I would be there. Where an oppressed person's rights would be given to. The Prophet also said, as Imam Ahmad narrated in his Musnad, on the authority of Abdul Rahman ibn Awfin, Shahitu Hilf al Mutayyibin. I was there. It's also called Hilf al Mutayyibin. Ma'umati with my uncles. Wa'ana ghulamun, I was a young boy. Fama uhibbu li humrun ni'am, he said. Fama uhibbu, I do not like for myself. Anna li humran ni'am, that I am given a red camel. Wa inni an eye and kuthu. Yani, I would not want a red camel in place for, for this contract. He, the world doesn't mean anything to me for what this contract and what it stood for and what it meant. Which his brothers and person who was oppressed, whose rights has been taken from them, who was mudlum, their haq should be given to them. This is very vital. Ridalika the Prophet والسلام, he was very this is قبل Islam, but he was proud of this thing they did. But we all together, brothers, Ibn Taymiyyah said something very powerful, a really powerful statement. He said, Rahimahullah, Allah, He aids a non Muslim leader if he's just. If the leader is not a Muslim, but he's just, Allah aids him. Over a what? A leader who's unjust, whether he's a Muslim. Are we all together? In Islam, justice and adil is very important. Are we all together, brothers? And this concept of jahiliyyah is sometimes in us. Is what? It's present in us. How is it present in us? If we know a family member of ours is doing wrong to somebody else, we believe I'm a member of my family. I'm not going to yeah, I mean, point out the truth I see. Stand up for the truth and what is right. Be just, be fair. If your brother does something to somebody else, he has a business, he's unjust. He oppresses. It's because he's your brother. Doesn't mean in no shape or form that you let him carry on oppressing other people. Rather, what you do is you aid your brother by grabbing him by the hand and stopping him from the oppression and giving the other people what? Their rights. Brothers, nas, the rights of the people with the day of judgment is very heavy. The rights of the people is heavy on the scale. When you come the day of judgment <clears throat> and you said something about somebody, you slandered them, or you said bad things about them, or you took their rights and you never gave it back. The day of judgment is not going to be dinar and dirham that you give back. 
The day of judgment, what is it going to be? It's going to be hasanat, your good deeds. So I encourage anybody who has people's rights on his neck, ask those people for forgiveness. min al mabalim. Ask those people, say, please forgive me for anything I've said or done to you. That's number one. Number two, give them their rights. Say to them, inshallah ta'ala, whether it's wealth and money, inshallah ta'ala, I have a system in place where I'll give you back your rights. Please, remember, this is your rights. Forgive me in the time being, but these are your hukuk. Make that person happy. Even if that person is a non-Muslim. Even if they're a non-Muslim. You've taken someone's rights, you're a dhalim, you're an oppressor. Are we all together, brothers? You're a what? An oppressor. وَلِذَلِكَ A lot of people when they sell, and you go to markets and shops, they will promise you, Allah, this is the best product. You buy it, you go home, it breaks, you bring it back. He says, I, I, I never sold anything to you. I don't remember you. Or the other person who's buying will try to uh, take the hack of the person that they're buying it from. Let's fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our doings and our actions and the things that we, we do. And we also always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Forgive us for our sins and our shortcomings. Allah, we are full of sins, right? And so many mistakes and shortcomings that we come with. So we ask Allah wa ta'ala, to forgive us, subhanahu wa ta'ala, for our private and our public affairs. Allahumma gfir lana dhunubana wa israfana fi amrina wa thabbit aqadamana wa nsurna ala qawm al-kafirin. Allahumma gfir lana hazlana wa jiddana wa khata'ana wa abdana wa kullu dhalika indana ya rabbal alameen. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار. I'm gonna stop there. Inshallah, Taala. Anything which I've said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and Shaytan and Allah His Messenger are both free from me. Just before I finish, I just want to remember something, brothers. I I love you all for the sake of Allah, right? You all know that, right? I do. I love you all for the sake of Allah. But there's a statement of Umar bin Khattab. He one day saw Ubay ibn Kaab. He saw the noble companion who. Ubay ibn Ka'b and so many people were following him. How many people? So many people. And Umar ibn Khattab said to Ubay ibn Ka'b, stop this. He said to Ubay, stop this. Why? He said, this is madhallatul lil matbu' fitnatul lil tabi'ah. It's a humiliation for the people who are following. And it's also a fitna for the person who's been followed. Now we all together. It's a fitna for the person who's been followed. So what I'm trying to hint is when I leave, I love you all for the sake of Allah, let's follow that statement of who? Umar ibn Khattab, that he said to a noble companion, Ubay ibn Ka'bir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Subhanakallahu wa bihamdi ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, astaghfiruka wa atubu